cool okay everyone welcome to the fourth breakout room of eof we've got some things on the agenda to discuss i think the main stuff is to talk about the open spec questions but i think it would be, would be good to just start with updates from various people so let's maybe start with client team updates Got a particular client team you want to start? I think that Besu has been on is unmuting. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so Besu, we have the five EIPs um, in a functional first pass implemented. Um, I haven't heard any update on changing the EOF container, so I went with the EOF container specified in the unified spec. Um, I don't know. You know, there's a lot of PRs flying around as to what the final state of the EOF container is. Um, but the uh, relative jumps in the function calls would be relatively unaffected if the container format was changed again. Um, so I've been trying to copy over test vectors from other clients, trying to get a unified test vector again. Um, you know, that, that I'm making them in such a way that they didn't rely on the container um, as far as, you know, being able to test what's going on with stuff like return F. Um, that's the tricky one because you got to do the code sections, have that logic built in. But relative jumps is all within one code run, so that's fairly isolated. So, so that's our status. We're ready to you know, start interopping and see what's going on with it. See what the more interesting contracts are to find where the real interesting breaks are. Okay, awesome, great. Uh, Aragon, is anyone here? Another mind. Okay, I can go, I guess, for guess. Um, I have rewritten our implementation of EOF. Uh, pretty much, you know, partially just to try and a couple of different approaches for things, but also to iron out the unified spec. So I've implemented the unified spec uh, from scratch in Geth. And yeah, I've replaced my PR. So if you've been looking at the EOF uh, bundled PR in Geth that now has that code instead of the older code, uh, the tests are still sparse, um, but I will be working on tests mostly for the next week, I think. And I will also tr be trying to help Mario with the tests for the cross clients tests. Any other clients here that didn't give an update? I could just speak quickly uh, for the work that we've done on Aragon. Uh, it's essentially been tracking your guest changes, uh, maintaining those. Uh, that's the general status. Okay, great. Uh, is any compiler teams here or anyone who has updates from the compiler work? We've just started work with the Viper team just yesterday. Okay, great. Uh, what is the timeline or plans, do you think? Uh, completely tippity. We've just started, so. Okay. Um, but it looks like the volume, um, you know, the, the, the volume of changes will be fairly small to it. Uh, the real problem is testing, because that depends on high EVM, who are nowhere. I see. Okay. Uh, I might mention this to the Pi EVM team. Alex. I can give an update from Solidity. Um, so Solidity has uh, a while ago merged uh, at least like the base scaffolding to support um, turning the EOF on and off. And then there are a number of PRs uh, which haven't been merged yet, but they are actively worked on. Um, there is a PR for the container format, uh, which is tested against EVM1. Um, there is another one for static jumps. And as of yesterday, there is also a working implementation of function sections. Um, 
uh, without using jump if, uh, only just call if and ret if. And they are seeing, um, I mean, they, in the first version, they had to disable all the optimization stages because uh, those need to be updated. Um, but with the optimization stages disabled, um, they are, which also means there's no deduplication of code, they are seeing a slight code uh, increase, which is expected with that deduplication. Uh, but at the same time, they are seeing measurable gas savings already. Um, and keep in mind, this is without having any kind of optimizations. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Great. Thanks for that update. Um, I guess that's probably our two compilers here. <clears throat> okay, so spec updates. Does anybody from the Epsilon team want to give an update about where you guys are at? I listed a couple of things on the agenda of things I know that are still open that we've been discussing, but would be happy to hear what you guys have been up to the last week or two. Um, so this week I I did merge some of the changes that were kind of under review for longer. Um, I think that the significant like functional change is that um uh, 30 3670 doesn't require terminating instruction um as the last um instruction in the code because that is supposed to be delivered by uh, 45, uh 54 50 and that's not to be in conflict and doesn't have like un redundant checks. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's mostly it. And the other one mostly editorial. Um, what is missing is this uh, <laughs> the the main container format. Obviously, I think we'll spend some time today on it and. Uh, I planned to reach like the last one, which is the stack validation, uh, but I kind of stopped on the jump F and read F, which has changed the semantics. Okay, maybe I should mention that as an additional functional change, but this happened when I was actually um, offline, let's say. So I'm not sure how much this was discussed previously. Uh, yeah, but uh, like both of them, uh, jump F and read F are specified in the way that they require automatic stack cleanup to be performed as a part of an instruction. Um, and I think this like the small small issues with this how this is done. So that's mostly like I had some concerns about it, and uh, that mostly stopped me from reaching the last EAP actually. Um, okay. I'm just browsing the, the the issue list, so I think um, like that's mostly reflects the the current status. So mostly, the container format is not <clears throat> is not finalized, and the stack validation doesn't expect to be like changed functionally functionally. But uh, yeah, the the IP needs bigger update in terms of just the text. Sounds good. Thanks for that update. Uh, do we want to start talking about the header format or do we want to jump and talk about the um, stack clearing for jump F and red F first? I guess we can talk about the header format first, if that's okay. <clears throat> um, honestly, I'm not sure what has really transpired since we last talked about it two weeks ago on this call. It seems like, you know, uh, Basu has implemented the, this unified spec version of the header format. I've implemented the unified spec version of the format. This is, you know, what, what are like the open questions here? We have this document. I can post it, the container simplification document. There's different proposals. There's different goals. 
I'm kind of at the place where I'm not really sure how to continue moving this forward. Hey, Pavel. Um, so how how do I how do I think about it? Is that like think like the basic option is do we want a strict format that kind of predefined where the values are in the on different offsets in the container so that this like i think it should be simple to to parse and like yeah like efficient in terms of how many bytes it uses but uh like the trade-off is <clears throat> you 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 lose all the flexibility to be like new stuff Add it later without breaking the, the compatibility with with current format. Um, so that's like I think one of on the options we have, and the, the other one is uh, just to improve what we currently have. So we keep the so difference is mostly do we want to have something like section kind as a byte that indicates what follows. So that is kind of extension point for later, uh, but we actually can skip that as well. And it, with with the 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 section kind kind byte, uh, I think we can improve what we currently have by introducing arrays instead of individual sections. Uh, I think this change is relatively simple, and I think it solves most of the of the issues. This change being what's listed in the unified spec with the array. Or something different. Uh, I think they're the two through almost identical variants of that. I don't remember exactly, and I'm not familiar with the unified spec. But uh, yeah, I guess like, but most yeah. like you, you have a section kind which says the code section, but like instead of have individual sizes, you just have array of sizes. So most of this, you have a like single code section, but it's it's separated by the by the size values into yeah. partitions, however we call it. But it's like it also has some additional benefits. So it kind of guarantees by design that <clears throat> the code sections or like these partitions of code will be adjusted. It's not like you can split code sections with with data sections and so on, like in on in, in general view, right. so I think it's nice. So it mostly saves you the this like linear <coughs> redundancy that you repeat the same byte all the time, but you have some this this additional bytes that kind of I think we could live with without it if we really want to. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's kind of the trade off. So there's like some fixed number of additional bytes in the header that will be placed so that's kind of as the original eof was designed but mm -hmm. um, yeah so i think that's that's mostly how how i understand it either we will really go really fixed format as like ip i don't know something like that right so like it's like two bytes are the the offset and and that's it or we go with a bit more fancy but it's not it's not more fancy that the UF originally proposed. It's kind of improved version of it. Right. I guess like one like thread of conversation that has transpired in the last week or two is this post by Vitalik. And I think that um, you know, one takeaway from this post is that it's like, you know, it seems like a very important thing to not have many EOF versions. Like we're talking like maximum two, but most likely like one EOF version. And so what we do, we should really consider about like the forward compatibility uh, the, or the future compatibility of things. And I think that having these kind types does make us much more flexible in the future over the fixed um, format. So that makes me lean like a bit in that direction. Um, Moody asked, has protobuf been considered for the container format? Do you guys have a comment on that? Uh, 
uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, I think, like, what we're currently trying to do is, like, to be, like, really that simple. Uh, that's why right. we just, like, have sizes of two bytes and that's, like, fixed. This not really... Uh, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe some people think it's, like, like bad, bad direction, but... Uh, So I guess what should we do to make a decision on this? We're like kind of getting to the point where it's really important to make the decision so clients can implement and start testing and we can be ready for this like January 5th deadline. Um, and it doesn't seem like a lot of new information has come out on this header format in the last two weeks. So do we have the ability to make a decision now or do we need to acquire more information to make it in the next couple of days. Um, so I'm I'm also kind of in the favor of having this more flexible one, like more generic format that leaves some space for extensions. Um, so if I think nobody protests in the sense that we want to kind of save every last byte of the format so that uh, the storage on the the codes on chain is like minimal so i think i would also go with a bit more flexible and if that the decision i think we can sort it with with matt uh, offline uh i think even today that's okay standing because i don't think there's like much, much friction points in the, the, the exact design so, so yeah, if that we go, if we go with this decision, then we can kind of propose, like present, um, kind of like single variant of that for review, uh, probably today or tomorrow. That's kind of my understanding. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Dano has a question. Same question as Moody, but for SSD. I think the same answer probably. Simplicity. Well, I, I certainly prefer a more flexible format so far as the forward compatibility issue. Um, we, we really shouldn't need very many future version bumps if we do this right. Right. Because adding an opcode doesn't change the version. That opcode never would have gotten through the validator. Um, and various other changes are like that. One of the few things that would require a version bump would be if we tightened up the validator um, to uh, give stronger barren, stronger guarantees, which would break would break previous code that couldn't be those guarantees. Yep. Uh, I, I posted the uh, anchor to the container format in the unified spec. We can take this offline and, you know, maybe change like a slight thing there. But if anybody on the call has a comment on this format right now, it would be good to say something. Otherwise, we'll post a, um, you know, finalized version to review later today or tomorrow. Um, yeah, answering like the the question about protobuf SSZ quickly, I, I I didn't fully explore that for sure. So, uh, but uh, what can I say? Uh, I think I'm not sure it's 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 like right time to kind of explore it. But uh, yeah, I think it, someone can kind of present example how that would look like. I think that would be fine as well, but I can't tell really if that helps or not. For for what we considered is um is something else, uh like having variadic number encoding. So it's kind of maybe like SSZ, I don't know SSZ actually, I know the RLP more. Um so whatever you have a size somewhere in the in the code or 
I guess mostly for the sizes and indexes, all of that, like we have fixed number of bytes uh, that can be replaced with the like variadic number of coding, which are relatively simple, but uh, and so sometimes it can save you one byte. Sometimes it can add you one byte, depends on, like, on the context. But if you have small numbers, most of the time, I guess it can reduce the two byte sizes to one byte uh, with some additional complexity added. So that's right. I think kind of the, this this question showed up like some like some number of times, especially when you consider we have because with the fixed sizes, uh, yeah, with fixed sizes of numbers, you can you kind of have to <laughs> pick the, the right size at the like very first moment, right? So for example, if you want what we discussed, for example, that uh, the call F, is it supposed to have like one byte index or two byte index? And with the like variadic encoding, you can kind of shuffle it because it will handle like small numbers as a one byte, byte encoding and like bigger numbers one as a two byte encoding. Um, yeah, but I most like we kind of were skeptical. We want to introduce complexity, uh, so that's why that wasn't officially in order. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other comments on this header format discussion? So maybe because this is recorded, but the uh, all the the chat text isn't a lot of conversation has happened there um, regarding the proposal of one that's using protobuf for SSD. And I wanted to add that initially we did, um, instead of like a fixed uh, length field, we did consider using lab 128, um, but then rejected the idea because we felt like even that would be too much complexity um, and clients would argue against that. Um, for not much savings. And if that um, argument is correct, then doing product buff or SSD seems like, uh, you know, even way more complexity. Um, I mean, that's why we haven't really gone to that direction. Yeah, that makes sense. I think from like the guest perspective, we would probably be against integrating like a parser like protobuf or web128 into consensus okay uh moving on let's chat about um let's chat about this stack cleanup question for red f and jump f um maybe Powell or Alex, you can give a overview of this. Um, like to, to my understanding, I kind of that's like my last two days to to digging um <clears throat> into the the specification of this specific aspect. Is that both the, the instructions need to kind of balance the stack at some point, like like jump f kind of do it before the call because it's like the beginning of the call, read, read f, do it and the call end. <clears throat> but they they kind of have um like specified the exact stack height is expected in the call on, on the end of the call, and they need to move the some stop stack items to this position in this way. So um, I kind of see like two issues with it, uh, like on technical level is it's it might be like complex in the sense like a bit time consuming operation because you can have functions that return over like 200 arguments or like receive 200 arguments. That means if the stack is unbalanced at this point, you need to move all of these 200 arguments to some different place. 
So it's kind of like man move move. And the size of this can be like significant. Um, so I, I, I don't think we kind of fully explored like what the complexity in terms of like how much expensive it is. But I don't, I'm not sure that the current gas costs actually properly reflect that. Uh, and <clears throat> I think what is what is even worse for it is that it depends on the use case. So like probably most of the use cases will not do it. But you can kind of you need kind of design for the worst case anyway. Uh, and the second one, I'm not sure I can like fully explain, but seems to be like the the reason is it's there. Maybe some other people can comment, but I will do an introduction. Is that it like provides some usability um, to, to users, but it means like for, for compilers mostly. Uh, but it feels to me like it kind of bundles it with uh, on the way that maybe it reduces issues in some other place. Um, this is related to the fact it depends on the like formally specified number of outputs, but some of the functions doesn't really have number of outputs because they never return because they just terminate execution. And so in this way, you have like pathological <clears throat> option to create multiple instructions that have exactly the same code, but formally they may, may be defined like returning different number of outputs and, um, and sometimes that might, might be needed to actually be more useful on the color side. Uh, okay, that's that's all from my side. Dano, then Daniel. So my concern with it is it's a, a variable execution time for such a low gas costed function. If we were to allow the stacks to be cleaned up, you know, you have a 500 item stack and you're passing 200 items to copy. That's at a minimum 200 copies and another 300 writes if you want to be safe and hold out the stack. And so that's highly variable for something that costs only three and four gas. So that's why I would advocate personally for, for getting rid of that option um, from a security perspective, because that's a way you could do a denial of service attack if it's, especially if it's coded, coded poorly. Daniel? Yeah, I think it was actually added to the spec after discussions with us. And uh, the reason for us uh, get, heading in that direction was fear of code deduplication becoming harder with uh, EOF in general, because we don't have cross uh, function jumps. And then in some corner cases, these uh, this specification of uh, not having to clean up the stack helps there. But given that we now have an initial implementation of the EOF functions, even though it's incomplete because it doesn't have the relative jumps yet, and the code size increase is not as much as I would have feared we could also live without this. So, I mean, I'm, I would be fine with dropping that. It's, yeah, I think we originally asked for it, but we would still be fine without it. Okay, um, that's good perspective. Um, yeah, I don't know what people think about that. I think, you know, generally it's better to obviously ship a little bit less and later on add things on because we can easily do that in EOF than shipping something like jump F that doesn't have quite have the exact characteristic that we want that we want. Yeah, I've I have never liked uh the automatic cleanup feature um for the reasons Pavel um gave us and some others. If it's explicit it's much easier to know that it's correct, um, both for the author of the code and the validator, and for just specifying what we mean by correct. Yeah, and we we can uh, always we can always add a clean up op code later that does what we realize that it really needs to do. Right, Pavel. Yeah, I mean, like from from EVM point of view, that's like like that would be definitely nicer approach but i i think it i try to understand and like i think partially understand like what is the usability case here and why this is like important um so kind of my problem is that i think it would be nice to spend like 
a bit more time on it to and especially now like solidity is starting to actually having like partial implementation and they can deliver a lot of useful data for experiments and like yeah just like yeah uh, like evaluating design decisions um but I feel like we don't have really time to do it. So I guess we need to make a decision in like one or two days about what exactly to do with it. So I like to my understanding, we kind of we're going, we're doing a step back and try to like fix it somehow. Uh, but what exactly it means, I think we'll try to figure out uh, hopefully this week. Um, is there, sorry for not raising my hand, this interface, I've never found a way to do it. Uh, <laughs> um, is there any real use case other than functions which have multiple returns that happen to be returning at different stack heights? Is the silence mean no? I mean, uh, one of the cases we wanted to get with this originally would be to uh, to be able to outline reverting helpers, but that the current spec even doesn't allow, but that we also needed to uh, be able to mark functions as never returning with, for example, 255 outputs, meaning that it never returns as another special case, which was never considered. So without that, that case even vanishes. And then I'm not sure there is actually use cases for the cleanup. Yeah, so like the original case was, uh, you can think about it like a, like a panic helper. So you have like different places in the contract that can panic and means like it does something wrong, but it goes to like, like, a, piece of code that actually handles the panic with some additional stuff. And that's 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 usually not executed, but it's there. And how they want like how they can't be doing that, uh, to my understanding, is to just like have like a single piece of code doing it and you jump there and it does the, the handling of the panic, maybe some logs, and then exits. And this kind of, it seems like simple use case, but it doesn't fit EOF very well if you have really strict function handling uh, for different reasons, but we kind of wanted to maybe improve the EOF design in the way that it, it's, it fits better this use case. Um, yeah, that's one thing. And the second one is, <laughs> There's something I, I started thinking about just by renaming the tail call F to jump F that you can actually have some different form of control flow using only jump Fs, which cause um, it allows you to jump around as a kind of fancy jump. But I think even the, the rename of that, which I think was a really good one, uh, Kind of allowed me to to think differently. How can we use these instructions? So, yeah, that's more more or less my comment about it. Maybe a bit more specific about the deduplication part. I mean, yeah, what we do in, in code generation in the end is deduplicating uh, code when we have blocks that yeah are identical and jump to from different locations. And before EOF, we can just yeah have several places and jump to the same code. And UF doesn't allow that anymore. So that's why we were worried that without that kind of deduplication, code size would blow up too much. But the first experimental results indicate that it's not as bad as feared. So. I was told during the discussions of 2315 that allowing such optimizations wasn't worth it because you people just inline things like that. Apparently not. Why wouldn't jump F suit that purpose? Uh, 
what purpose? The deduplication purpose. I mean, we ask for jump F because of deduplication. It's just depending on how it's specified, it works better in all cases for deduplication, or in some cases, deduplication is not almost free. I mean, before EOF, uh, EOF deduplication is absolutely free. Mm -hmm. So yeah, depending on yeah. how jump F is specified, for example, for revert helpers, we would need to first clean up the stack and then jump, which is probably, depending on the situation, more code than the deduplication would actually gain us. So that's that was the reasoning. But yeah, as I said, it's uh, the code size increase doesn't turn out to be as bad as I feared. So uh, maybe this we could live without optimizing for these cases, at least in the first version. Okay. Yeah, so the reason is <clears throat> that if you have different functions that want to have additional helper, like shared helper, which is like third function, um, if the place you want to jump F to it have different stack heights, you can't reuse the same one. Although it actually would work because this helper never actually returns. So it doesn't matter how much outputs it returns, but the number of outputs the helper declares, which can be zero and number of inputs kind of have to balance the stack. Maybe I'm missing something, but <laughs> uh, usually I need to draw it to figure out what's going on, but at least there's some like additional restrictions like kind of validated that prevents you use the same helper from different places if they have something different going on. Does anybody feel strongly about trying to keep jump F in for big EOF? Well, if we don't have it, we can't do tail call optimization. It feels like, like the debate right now is that we're not sure exactly the best way of doing this. And I don't know how long it would take to figure that out. And so it seems like it would be better to remove it from the scope here and think about the best way to do this for Cancun or for a future fork. And I'm trying to figure out, A, is that something that people are interested in doing or do we want to try and resolve this now? And B, is there a way that we can do this? Because I think now Red F won't have the stack cleanup and we need to have this future compatible. So we won't be able to modify Red F in the future to have stack cleanup. So is there a way of doing jump F or tail call F um, in combination with some M move op code that people feel would you know, solve the, the problems they're trying to solve? If we have a spec for jump F, that does solve the helper problem and I guess would need a dynamic gas cost, um, then it'd be nice to get it in now because Cancun's been promised for the summer, but we know what our track record is for delivering upgrades uh, on any schedule. So, um, I, I'm sort of torn there. It would be good to take more time to get it right. So the other side is that if Solidity can can do without it now and just use function calls, um, uh, those are the, the two sides to it. Um, but I, I would be happy if we really have a solid spec to go with it. Sure. I'm I'm just like worried we're getting to the place where we need to settle the spec down. And if we don't, then right. there's like a possibility that it, EOF doesn't happen at all. That's right. And so I would I would rather be forward compatible with a future jump F. And since Solidity doesn't seem to be pushing that hard for jump F in this first version, I think it would be good to consider tabling it. The question is, is it possible to table this and still solve it in a good way in the future? Does anyone have a comment on that? 
<clears throat> uh, yeah, I'm not really good uh, fast thinker, but uh, I think that that's the kind of the restricted version of JAPF, which is kind of like the fused call and read return read F. Like if you put this two instructions next to each other in the code, that's kind of I think it works. Uh, except that it cannot overflow the call stack, but that's so I think that's uh, that's not really problematic to be included this way. I'm not sure how much this is useful though. Uh, if we can do it better later, um, I think we can, but I'm also guessing here because we, we can always introduce new instructions. Um, so I guess we can. <laughs> we can then specify it as we want. I think it doesn't really matter so much. I mean, obviously, yeah, no. if you can imagine how it would work in the future, that's always better. But I think the number of options are, are not not really limited. So, um, I think we should have RedF and JumpF. Um, they have they, there's no stack cleanup on it, and we can introduce a stack cleanup opcode if needed because you're gonna per stack validation, you're gonna know what your stack looks like at that point anyway. And with a stack cleanup opcode, it's easier to price because you have the extent and how many you're keeping as part of the call in it. So we could scale the cost up appropriately um, just by looking at the operation and not looking at the stack. So that's, if it, you know, if, if an implementer's uh, opinion matters, I think that's what I would prefer seeing to solve some of the security concerns. What are your thoughts on that, Paul, Alex? I mean, I, I don't have any problem uh, with jump F and treat F without stack cleanup. I think that's, I mean, unless I find something when I actually start writing the exact text for it, but uh, it looks it looks okay to me uh, to have three of these instructions for function manipulation. Um, and yeah, they, they can be <laughs> either enriched with, Stack cleanup later, because I think we can, yeah, we can we can like kind of break it with backwards compatibility this way, because previous contracts will be will require no stack stack cleanup because that will be guaranteed by the validation, but we can lose that. I mean, lose the other requirement later, and I see. So that's that's the option, obviously. And yeah, what Dana suggested also so, sounds nice to have like dedicated instruction actually for that case, not to uh, bundle that with <clears throat> the the control flow instructions. That also sounds nice. Yeah, uh, Daniel, do you have any comment on how useful this would be if the jump F and red F don't uh, do the stack cleanup, but we have a separate opcode? That performs the operation. I think that would give the same behavior. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm rather wondering whether it would cause any problems to just disallow 255 return values for a function for now, and then decide whether that should stand for never returning or not in the future. Right. If we could mark functions as never returning in the future, then those could be jump f from any stack height. That would be a path when you don't have to decide anything now we can reserve this one output thing we can then either just allow that if it turns out we don't need that or we can make it special uh, in this way if that turns out to be necessary and is that a path i mean yeah i'm not sure how much of a trouble reserving that particular amount of output would be but that would seem to me like something that is safe to do and would allow for anything in the future yeah, I think I'm pretty positive on that. It, okay, yeah, Pavel says thumbs up. I think we should do that. I think we should reserve that. Should we reserve only one? Like, is there any other, like, should we reserve three places there at the end? Is there another, um, Pavel says max it at 200. Are there other centile values we might want?
Wouldn't 128 be cleaner? Then we could use the sign bit as a flag to say this is a magical value. Is there a use case where we need more than 128 stack items in a call? That's probably a question for Daniel. I mean, so far, uh, we're basically in the amount of 16 because of the stack height, uh, stack accessibility anyway. So right. if in Cancun we consider 663, then we can fix all this, but it doesn't need to be fixed before. And before that, 128 would be enough, I think. We could always lift it too, if we build the yep. sentinels from 255 down. Okay, that seems like a pretty good idea to me. Is anyone opposed to that? Uh, I've I've lost track of which which proposal we're at now. So right now we're talking about reserving the upper byte of. Um, sorry, which opcode are we talking here? Would this be the type? I thought this was the type sections for the inputs. Not oh, sorry. <clears throat> I, I'm still much in favor of keeping uh, return F as simple as possible. And yep. having any cleanup go to a separate op code that we can design more carefully. Yep. So I think the proposal right now is to reserve the upper byte in a type section of outputs. Um, and so for now, we'll require a maximum of 128 outputs for the function and at some later points maybe cancun we can either open it up or make a decision on how to use that upper band of outputs and we will specify a deep pop mem move type of opcode i think dano posted in the chat something what it would look like and that could be used in conjunction with red f or jump f to clean the stack but we will not have um, automatic stack cleaning by those ops. Sounds good to me. Okay, great. Any final comments on red F, jump F, E pop, et cetera? Okay. We have nine minutes left. There's a few more things to talk about. Uh, I mentioned this one little thing that kind of came up when I was reviewing some of the proposed test vectors for EOF. There was some discussion about disallowing unreachable code that's not in the spec right now. It's not part of the validation spec as far as I'm aware. Is that something that we want to add? Is that important? Yes. Yes. Yes, I want it very much. <laughs> that's enough. Okay. So the, the benefit is like you don't have garbage code. That's one thing, but you also that allows you to to do validation in single pass over all the all the instructions, but not in the in the order. And that's all only allowed when you have this requirement. Okay, uh, that seems pretty convincing. That's something we need to put into the EAPS and the unified spec because it's not there yet, but we can get those updated. Um, it makes code much easier to read in other ways too. Just scanning it from one end to the other, you can tell for sure. Right. You can tell the certain certain byte codes actually don't ever get executed. Um, you know, how do you know that without traversing the code? And if nothing there is, if nothing there is not executable, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. Okay, are there any other open issues that people wanna discuss?
This is a question because I'm lost in specs. I think some of which aren't up to date yet. Uh, we have the max height field now, uh, which I don't see in the call F spec yet. Um, and I'm not clear on whether the uh, author of the routine uh, fills that in or it's getting filled in by the validator. Uh, the author of the routine would fill it in and it would be verified by the validator, but the EAP still needs to be updated. Okay. Uh, Dano says ret F with an empty return stack is an exception, correct? I don't think it's possible to have an empty return stack. Ret F in section zero, um, in section zero, before you start the execution, you actually push all zeros onto the return stack. So what do you do then when you get a ret F in section zero and you've done nothing else? Return the whole call? So it's another yeah, way to yeah. return? Yes, I think that's 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 how it's going to specify it. You just okay. like it just stop, terminate, yeah. terminate the execution. I think there were some concerns that it should be exception. I don't I don't have so much opinion about that. But I like the point where it's a stop because I could see you wanting to in esoteric cases recurse into section zero. So I'll I'll treat it as a stop. Cool. Um if that's not clear in the spec, maybe leave a comment in the EVM channel and we can make it clear. <clears throat> I think it should be spelled out in the spec, so I'll put a comment there. Okay, thanks. Five minutes left, two more things to discuss. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to just talk about the timeline for EOF and Shanghai. I think most people here were on all core devs or are kind of aware that we're sort of sprinting towards this January 5th all core devs date. That's the first one of 2023. And they've requested that we have EOF implemented in clients. Um, and that's kind of like the first gate of that we need to pass to make sure that EOF is like Shanghai ready. I'm curious to know how people feel about that if there's any questions or concerns about that specifically. I know it's not really ideal in any realm that we're having to deal with these things over the holiday period. Um, yeah, I would have much rather be doing this in the fall or the summer, but we have this chance of shipping EOF and I think we need to take advantage of it. Um, and so I will be available as much as I can. If anybody has questions or things that need to be done, I can try and do it. Um, yeah, I think it sounds like most people have implemented EOF and we're just trying to finish these last few things. I think if we can have these spelled out in the spec, tomorrow end of day that you know will give people a week and a half of like uh, you know sort of holiday working time to try and resolve a couple of those things i'll try and we'll be working on tests hopefully by the next eof call which i think we scheduled for the 29th of december i'll have to show up, I'll double check the discord we'll have cross client tests that we can start verifying and then that will give us a couple of days, the beginning of 2023 for client implementers to review the status of the test and resolve this, some of those things. And I think if we come into that for January 5th, that's a good place to come into. The last thing to just mention is uh, this post by Vitalik. I think a lot of people have seen it, but just if you haven't, I would take a look. Basically, Vitalik is making a case that if we're going to upgrade the EVM, there are new possibilities that we could have if we make certain decisions. And this possibility that he's interested in is force upgrading code. That hasn't been possible really. It wouldn't be possible with the currently specified EO version due to the fact that we can introspect code. Um, and so he's proposing maybe banning opcodes that allow for code introspection. Unfortunately, that it means a lot of opcodes would be altered or banned. 
we would have to change how legacy contracts call these opcodes into EOF contracts. I think it's like it's a relatively big change. Um, and I think that that's going to get discussed on this all core devs. And I'm not really sure what the outcome of that will be. I don't think that there's much that we can do in the time between now and then to resolve the questions that Vitalik has raised. And I think the best thing that we can do is come to all core devs on January 5th with big EOF in clients and cross client tests and stuff, and then see how important people feel. One thing that we might be able to do that doesn't really resolve any changes or that doesn't require any changes is to sort of make this commitment to people that code introspection is actually similar to the gas schedule. You shouldn't be using it in, um, you shouldn't be using it in contracts with the assumption that it's never going to change. We can make the commitment that obviously if you call a contract, it's going to return the same value forever. But if you call code size in that contract, it might change. That's like one possibility. Another possibility is just being extremely ruthless with um, banning all of those opcodes and maybe adding things back in as we find a solution. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the status with that. Again, I think maybe we should focus on the big UF implementations before we spend too much time thinking about how to resolve those concerns. Alex. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give like a, a brief um, like background info on that. When we initially proposed UF, um, you know, back like almost two years ago, um, we actually wanted to have a data copy opcode. Um, some of the early documents um, have this explained. Um, a data copy would be used for the data section, obviously. Um, if any of this introspection stuff is removed, you would need to have something like that, um, ideally, um, because a lot of contracts depend on so-called um, immutable variables, which are encoded in, in such a way and loaded uh, with uh, code copy currently. So for that, you would need data copy. Um, but I guess this is more like a, a usability question. Um, however, the, the second point is, even if you disable introspection from within EOF, uh, EOF code outside from legacy code can still be inspected. Um, and you cannot, I mean, you can only give like verbal commitments there that uh, you shouldn't do that. Um, but if, if people start to do that and rely on that, uh, will that mean that uh, all of this was for nothing because you, you still cannot update it? Um, so I think that's like a, a bigger meta question. Um, but personally, I mean, right. I'm I'm interested in restricting stuff, and we actually had these to some extent discussed uh, last year, so way before you know it came up um, last week. Um, but we felt like it would be like a an immense amount of changes, um, and hence we didn't fully explore it at the time. Bob. Yeah, just to ask about testnet, just thinking it would be very useful to have a full EOF testnet sooner rather than later. Uh, obviously, you know, if the specs are still moving a little bit, maybe not so great, but just the thought that we should really move on that soon. I personally feel that cross-client testing is a higher priority than testnets. Um, it would resolve I, like I think there's like you know less interoperability things to concern with because it's not changing like any of the networking blockchain structure more or less. Uh, it's something we want to do ASAP, but in my mind, like order of op operation right now is finalize spec, work on cross client tests and testnet. I think cross client tests and testnet can be done mostly in parallel, but if, like personally, I will be working more on testing specifically. If we can get this spec finalized in the next day or two, and you know, people want to help run the testnet end of next week, like let's do it. But that's where my mind is. We're three minutes over time. Any last comments? Yeah, I mean that that, that makes sense. I'm, I'm just thinking we don't want to like wait too long. Agreed. We definitely want to be doing a testnet by the next UF call. 
which I believe is January 29th. I'm really sorry, or sorry, December 29th. I'm really sorry that we're doing, yeah, breakout rooms this time of year, but um, I'll be there. There'll be time to discuss any questions or comments that have come up and hopefully we'll have testnet by then. Anything else? Great. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, please yeah, share any comments or questions in the EVM channel on Discord. We'll work on finalizing the spec. I think that there were about three or four decisions that we've like roughly made. We'll send an update with um, yeah, that stuff being resolved here soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Fairly well. <laughs>